In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, you invite us to be perfect as you are perfect. May we live a life in following your footsteps. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in our cases today, we hear the challenge that Christ puts before each and every of us to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. He goes on to say, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the landscape of political tension and grassroots dreams, Jesus tells his followers not to take up arms, but to be bearers of the kingdom by turning the other cheek, looking their enemies, or loving their enemies, praying for those who persecute them, and being perfect as God is perfect. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. This call is not for the faint heart. It is a demonstration of God's love for all. The God who allows the sun to shine on the evil and the good, and life giving rain to fall on the just and the unjust. God, who has power over life and death, who provides life sustaining conditions even for those who are dramatically opposed to his groups. It is true that anyone can love the lovely, but Jesus demands that we love those who are incapable of showing love in return. This is not about fairness, but love. If we are to heal the brokenness in our lives, reconcile our relationships, and end the violence in our world, we must stop being fair towards each other and start loving one another. We must quit stomping on each other. Evil for evil, violence for violence, Hit for hit, word for word, will never change anything. It only escalates the violence and entrenches us deeper in the way things already are. It only reveals who we say and who guides our thinking and our actions. This is precisely what the kingdom of heaven offers where anger results in reconciliation rather than retaliation, where enemies are overcome by love rather than violence. God's kingdom is bigger than any ruler. His power is greater than an oppression. For God's justice prevails he proves this with his selfless kingship, with a crown of thorns and a Roman cross. Contextualize on our pericope for our character cases today. We note that earlier Jesus said, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Matthew chapter 5, 
verse 17. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our parable of our current case is today Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48, is part of a larger section of Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 up to 47, which provides Six examples illustrating what Jesus means by fulfilling the law. In our previous catechesis, we dealt with the first four examples, namely Jewish laws on prohibiting murder, prohibiting adultery, requiring a certificate of divorce, and prohibiting false swearing. However, in our country cases today, we are looking at the last two examples, namely, limiting revenge and loving neighbors. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus shows us how to move beyond routine observance of these laws to the spirit behind them, and how to embrace the spirit of the law. And how to be true children of God who reflect God's love and God's will in our everyday actions and relationships. Jesus does not play upon the people's anger towards injustice, nor incite them to take revenge. There is no battle cry here. In fact, after hearing this sermon, one wonders why Jesus kept attracting crowds at all. Why would these masses take such a risk to follow Jesus? The Romans, as a matter of fact, did not take kindly to large crowds following would-be kings. These masses of people, however, have already had a taste of God's kingdom. Among them are those whom Jesus had healed. They know that Jesus has great power. They have experienced the good news of the kingdom. And they will risk everything to follow him. Wherever he goes. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ. In this era of political tension. Jesus calls his audience not to take up arms, but to be bearers of the kingdom by not resisting one who is evil, but turning the other cheek, loving their enemies, praying for those who are persecuting them. Who, when wronged, it is better to suffer more wrong than to, write, to reiterate the unjust. Jesus causes the followers to be perfect as the Heavenly Father is perfect. This is a high standard for all who would claim to be disciples. They are not simply taught to meet the minimum requirements of the law. They are to fulfill the intentions of the law. They are not just caught a new one when wrong. They are called to love the oppressor. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us now revert to a Bible text for further reflections. The Bible text reads in part, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist him who is evil. Whoever strikes you on your right cheek, Turn to him the other also. If anyone sues you to take away your cloak, let him have. If anyone sues you to take away your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and don't turn away who desires to borrow from you. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. 
My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ quotes from the Old Testament as he says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is known as the law of retaliation or the law of revenge. While it might seem barbaric, it represented an early attempt to ensure justice and to limit revenge. Under the law of retaliation, a person who has been wronged can seek revenge against the person who committed the wrong, regardless of the relative status of the two people. At least in theory, the law gave the ordinary person recourse against a wealthier or more powerful person. It also constrained revenge to the extent of the injury. That is, a person who has suffered the injury of an eye is not allowed to kill the person who caused the injury, but can only injure that person's eye in return. Therefore, the law was an attempt to regulate and save to regulate and make a process by which people seek redress for injuries. Law of retaliation is one of the earliest legal systems in human history. We can assume it was practiced for a considerable time. The Old Testament incorporated the law of retaliation in Deuteronomy, where it says, your, your eyes shall not pity. Life for life, eye for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and food for food. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21. Also, Exodus chapter 21, verses 23 to 25. Leviticus chapter 24, verses 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, over time, however, the practice was modified in Israel to allow the injured party to obtain a monetary reward or award in lieu of inflicting injury on the guilty person. Thus, further civilizing the process. However, Jesus confronted the scribes and Pharisees because they wrongly applied the law of retribution or retaliation to personal relationships to justify personal revenge. The scribes and Pharisees should have known personal revenge was forbidden in their law. We shall not take revenge, or vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people. I am the Lord. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Father, Jesus says, But I tell you, do not resist him who is evil. This principle would put Jesus at odds with, the Je with the Jewish ze zealots who sought to expel the Romans by force. Jesus is not suggesting that the public has no right to police itself. This is a call for the individual Christian not to retaliate or to engage in vigilantism to demonstrate this, Jesus illustrates with four examples how to respond when someone strikes you or sues you, forces you to go a mile, or begs from you. And he says, but whoever strikes you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. To be struck on the right cheek is more serious than to be struck on the left cheek. To be struck on the right cheek means either that the striker is using his left hand, his toilet cleansing hand, 
or that he is using a right backhand, a particularly grievous insult. To be slapped hard is a startling experience that sparks a surge of adrenaline and incites quick re retaliation. It is difficult, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to imagine a man being slapped who would not instinctively retaliate. However, Jesus calls us to go against our natural instinct. He calls us not to try to maintain our whole number exacting revenge. He calls us to make ourselves vulnerable instead of retaining blow for blow. While this might seem passive, it is instead a way of seizing the initiative to demonstrate Christian values rather than following the violent agenda set by the striker. Later, Jesus will outline a procedure by which a Christian can confront another Christian who has committed an offense against him or her. Confirm Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 and 17. While well, that procedure has the potential for relegating the offending Christian to the status of an outsider, it is not for the purpose of vengeance, but for correction. And St. Paul reinforces this concept of non-retaliation, saying, don't seek revenge yourselves, beloved, but give place to God's wrath. For it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Also Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35. Jesus says, If anyone sues you to take you your tunic, let him have your cloak also. The picture that Jesus paints here is of a legal action to take the shirt of a man's back. Jewish law prohibits taking a person's cloak or shirt. If you take your neighbor's garment as collateral, you shall restore it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What would he sleep in? Exodus chapter 22, verses 26 and 27. Also Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 10 to 13. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to surrender both tunic and cloak would render a man essentially naked which suggests that Jesus is using exaggerated language to make the point that we are to diffuse conflict by yielding more than is required. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus goes on to say, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Roman law at that time permitted its soldiers and other officials to require people to carry a burden for a mile. It is under that provision that Simon of Syria was required to carry Jesus' cross. Confirm Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. Service of this sort can be quite oppressive. But Jesus tells us not to poison ourselves with resentment, but rather to seize the initiative by doing more than is required. And he says, give to him who asks you, and don't turn away from him who desires to borrow from you. Again, the principle is to go beyond what is required and to act generously. However, St. Augustine noted that Jesus requires us to give to him or us, but not necessarily what he asks. 
Jesus further says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who mistreat you and persecute you. That you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to, shine, to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 45. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 41, Jesus gave specific illustrations of people whom we might characterize as enemies, those who injure us, or strike us, or sue us, or compel us. In each case, he gave a specific remedy, turn the other cheek. Also, let him have your cloak as well. Go with him to Mount. Now, Jesus turns to the principle that underlies these apparently passive responses, the principle of love. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. The Torah requires Israel to love their neighbors and to avoid vengeance or grudge bearing. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. It also prohibits oppression of aliens leaving their needs and says, You shall love him, the foreigner with you in your land as yourself. Leviticus 19, verses 33 and 34. The Old Testament nowhere requires Israel to hate its enemies. Hating enemies comes naturally. So there would be no need of such a commandment if indeed God wanted Israel to hate its enemies. God did. On occasion, command Israel to destroy its enemies. Confirm Numbers chapter 31, verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 2 as well as chapter 13, verse 15, chapter 20, verse 17, 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 3. But that was to avoid contamination by pagan regions rather than to save as an expression of hatred. And Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who mistreat you. And as well as persecute you. Jesus makes the word enemies plural here. Which gives this commandment a very broad scope. There are three words for love in the Greek. Eros, Phoebus, and the Archa. Elos, a word not used in the New Testament, is romantic or sexual love. Philos, used occasionally in the New Testament, it is brotherly love. Agape is used frequently in the New Testament. Agape is the divine selfless love, which will go to any length to attain the well-being of its object. As such, Agape is more an action word than a feeling word. A person who loves with agape might or might not have warm feelings towards the beloved, but will be concerned for the welfare of the beloved and will do what is possible to help the beloved. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, agape is the love with which God loves us. Agape is the love with which a mother loves her child. 
Agape is the love that causes a soldier to fall on a grenade to save his companions. Agape is the love that causes an adult to risk his or her life to save a drowning child. It is agape that Jesus calls us to have for our enemies. Love that it makes it possible for us to turn the other cheek. To give more than is required. To go the second mile. And to give generously to those who ask. Jesus says, so that you may be children of your father in heaven. Agape. Agape love might shame the enemy into becoming our friend. But Jesus in no way suggests that this is the motive behind loving our enemies. Agape love is not a clever strategy for improving our situation, but focuses instead on helping the other person to improve his or her situation. Jesus calls us to show agape love to our enemies, so that we may be children of our Father in heaven. By showing agape love even to our enemies, we act as true sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, who loves even his enemies. Jesus calls us to be true sons and daughters of our Father in heaven, a Father who loves even our enemies. A father who loves even his enemies just calls us to please our Heavenly Father by loving our enemies. For God makes his Son rise on the evil and good, sends rain on the just and the unjust. We see this principle at work every day. The sun does not give its light to the righteous farmer alone and deny its light to his unrighteous neighbor, not at all. The rain does not respect property lines, but falls indiscriminately on the land regardless of ownership. So also the sun shines on the fields of the righteous and unrighteous at the same time. Some hard-working, honest, kind, gentle people become worldly successful, but others don't do well at all. Some crooks get rich, live long and healthy lives, and have lots of, of mourners at their funeral. We might be inclined to conclude that there is no justice, but God has eternity to render justice. For if you love those who love you, what do you, what do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? If you only greet your friends, what more do you do than others? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? Matthew chapter 5, verses 46 and 47. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus is now reminding us that it takes no special enlightenment to love those who love us. Even evil people love those who love them. If we love only those who love us, we are no better than these evil people and can expect no favor from God. Favor? The Jewish greeting, Shalom, peace conveys God's blessing and is more than a routine greet. The person who gives a word of blessing only to close family members has rendered no unusual service, has demonstrated no special spirituality. Even Gentiles, Gentiles presumed spiritually illiterate and morally bankrupt, have good ways for their own family. God expects us, his children, to do more than these ordinary people. God expects us to bless even our enemies. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven 
is back. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is a difficult verse with which Jesus concludes this parable. It sounds as if he is demanding that we be saved. It sounds as if he's raising the bar to impossible heights and he's then requiring us to jump it perfectly. It sounds as if there is no hope of grace and no hope of meeting the impossible standards that Jesus sets out in this passage. It sounds as if he is trapping us in a corner from which there is no escape. But that would be completely inconsistent with his mission to save us from our sins. The word means something that is complete, that has reached its goal or fulfilled its purpose. To understand what Jesus means here, when he tells his disciples that they need to be perfect, as God is perfect, Better we go to the Old Testament where God said to Israel, You shall be holy, for I, Yahweh, your God, am holy. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. To be holy is to be set apart for God's purposes. And this is what Christ is asking us. The Sabbath was holy because God set it apart as a day for worship and rest. The tabernacle and the temple were holy because they were set apart as places for people to worship and to experience the praises of God. Priests and, Le and Levites were holy because God set them apart for his sakes. Israel was holy because God had chosen them to be his people. Now Jesus calls his disciples to be perfect, mature, and complete people who have fulfilled the purpose to which God has called them. People who have become the people that God created them to be. This is what he calls us to be. This is what he invites us to become. Salient points for further reflection. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if we are to heal the brokenness of this world, to reconcile the relationships of this world, and to end the violence of this world, we must stop being fair towards each other and start loving one another. Evil for evil, violence for violence, word for word, will never change anything. If anything, it escalates the violence and entrenches us deeper in the way things already are. Fairness can never change our lives and our world. Only love can do. Turning the other cheek. Giving your last piece of clothing. Going an extra mile. That means choosing to love instead of fairness. It means non-retaliation. It means loving our enemies. And praying for those who hurt. Most of us may not be physically humiliated, but each of us has heard the gossip, name-calling, and labeling that is sting like a slap on the cheek. What do we do then? Fairness will only get us into a shouting match and replay the argument in our head. It is possible that no one is suing you for your clothing. 
But you may have experienced how demanding others can be more than you can manage. They demand your time. They demand your attention. They demand your assistance. The question remains, do you offer a defense negotiate a fair settlement or offer all that you are the all that you have. What about that extra mile? Your plans and routine may be interrupted and disrupted. Others walk into your schedule. You do not plan on carrying their burdens, sorrow and grief. Loneliness, sickness, or addiction, depression, bad choices, mention what? Fairness says that's their problem. Love is empathetic and it says, I will go with you. I will suffer with you. I will give you my shoulder. I will cry with you. All in all, the challenge is to stop being fair and instead be loving. Fairness is a transaction. Love is a relationship. It is usually easier to be fair than to love. Love is messy and risky. It comes with burdens and obligations. You can get hurt. Look at the life of Jesus. He is not asking us to do anything he did not do. He was beaten and humiliated. He carried our burden to the cross. That is not fair. That is love. Jesus came to call us into the kingdom and to show us the way of perfection. Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Jesus is echoing God's command. You shall be holy. For I the Lord your God am holy. We must discover our holiness. Move towards perfection. And reveal God's spirit within us. In all our relationships. The people that we live with. In our places of work during our busy errands, the victims of injustice that we see, the strangers on the street. In so doing, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are executing love. We are trying to be perfect, just as God himself is perfect. The choice is ours. Let us pray. God our Father, we thank you for inviting us to be perfect as you are. You have set us apart for your kingdom. You have set us apart for your greater responsibility to share in your kingdom, to love others as you have loved us. We make our prayer. Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.